role in Cooney. Um, and Ronan is the Sustainability Officer at BIM. He has recently joined the organisation after working at University of Galway for the past seven years. And before that, he worked with Inland Fisheries Ireland and the Marine Institute in various roles, such as environmental assessments and as a fisheries analyst. He holds a BSc in Marine Science and a PhD in Civil Engineering. He's been involved in the research of aquaculture, fisheries, processing and byproduct valorization. His main areas of research have been life cycle assessment, ecosystem services of aquaculture and seafood circularity. Um, um, you're going to touch on the circular economy and the marine byproduct utilization today. So fair play, you have your screen ready to go. So take it away. Sorry, Ronan, you're still muted. There we go. Still getting to grips with Zoom. It's about, I don't know how long since I've used it. But uh, no, thanks very much for, for the, the kind introduction. And uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, so as, as Kleena mentioned, I'm fairly new with BIM. Um, I'm, this is my fifth month in with them. So uh, what I'm gonna, gonna focus on today is just a kind of a mix of background, very high level background, and then some of the stuff that I would have done, and then closing out with some of BIM's work. So I suppose to display that graphically, I'm just going to introduce the topic of marine byproducts, circular economy, seafood circularity, and uh, closing out then with life cycle assessment and some examples of BIM's work as part of this. So, <clears throat> so marine byproducts, you know, what are they? So broadly, if we wanted to use a, a textbook definition, it's something produced in addition to the principal product. But as Maria mentioned before, we need to change that terminology and, and change to something called a, a, by, a co product or the byproducts. So when we look at seafood, we can see that it is anything and everything. It covers everything from fin fish to cephalopods to seaweeds. Uh, we've got two different, meat, two different systems for seafood production. So from nature in the form of uh, fisheries and from you know, farming activities such as aquaculture. Other sources of byproduct can arise from processing and the packaging side of things, as well as distribution and uh, consumption and end of life uh, when we get to it. And as well, I need to update my slides and change the terminology from seafood waste to uh, seafood co-products. So when we, when we look at seafood co-products or byproducts, we see that there are quite a number of different, uh, different materials. Each of them has applications that can be, can be utilized for, for any number of um, either higher biotechnology or f food, feed or uh, fuel as well, and not forgetting uh, fertilizer. So but when, when we talk about marine byproducts and the amount of them that are uh, there and ready for use, one thing that we need to bear in mind is that we can only use a certain amount of them. And these are governed by uh, this current number of European regulations. And depending on the risk, um, there are limitations on what we can use. So typically the, the high risk materials, just cat ones, you know, they are widely just going to be used for disposal only. Category two, we could see some some safe technical uses arising from that. But the main one <clears throat> where we'll see um, the opportunity for implementation of circular economy and byproducts is um, is category three, which which can be used for fertilizers, it can be used for pet food and uh, animal feeds, as well as uh, biotech, uh, pharmaceutical applications and pharma industry uh, applications as well. So when we talk about the circular economy, <clears throat> one of the things we need to, one of the things that you'll see seafood byproducts um, coming in under, sorry, I'm just gonna take a glass of water. Uh, one of the things that we see seafood byproducts coming in <clears throat> as part of is the circular economy. And if we wanna go and get a textbook definition again of what a circular economy is, it's a system solution framework that tackles global challenges. But why do we need it? One of the things that we're currently practicing is this thing called the linear economy, where we take, make, and we waste um, the, the products that we use. But ideally, what we want to try and do is implement a circular economy where we minimize the waste out of a system and where we increase and retain the, the amount of material that's used. And I suppose one of the reasons that we need to start to, to focus on this circular economy concept is because the distance between consumption and production has, has increased uh, at an amazing rate in, in, the last number of, in the last number of decades, where people are no longer 
actively involved in the production of particularly the food products that they consume. Um, and we have a loss of value and a perception of loss of the perceived value of these products. Whereas once upon a time uses for all these materials would have been um, would have been found. So to how do we represent that? Uh, so this is one of the things that we would have I would have collaborated on previously in um, in my role at NUA Galway, uh, now University of Galway. Uh, this interreg Atlantic Area project uh, called Neptunus, where we were looking at the different materials, the different products, and the different strategies that we could take to valorize these um, byproducts. So the pyramid here in the background indicates a you know kind of a volume a volume uh, relationship where we have lower volumes going into higher value applications and you know higher volumes going into lower value ap applications down here and if you'll recall back there are two slides these are our byproducts back again and this is where based on um, the kind of volume to value ratio and the levels of technology that are currently available these are the the, the, the opportunities that we saw for some of these co-products and byproducts so <clears throat> typically energy and fertilizer will be seen as the, the lowest value but highest volume opportunities. And they would utilize technologies such as thermal processing, fermentation, uh, anaerobic digestion. And one of the interesting things, I suppose from a BIM perspective that is worth bearing in mind is that integrated multi-trophic aquaculture is seen as um, a circular strategy, particularly for uh, the production of fertilizer. Uh, other higher applications in include using technologies like supercritical fluids, fermentation, ultrasonification and from that we arrive at uh, some of the compounds and the, the value-added products that Maria had mentioned early on like the, the hydrolysis and the, um, the amino acids. So these, these technologies are these stages and these kind of frameworks for valorization of these uh, side streams or, or, or byproducts, these can be supported through a series of other documents. So one of the one of the documents that we would have worked with quite quite a lot when we were kind of trying to come up with this kind of framework and this this diagram was the best available techniques uh, as put out by the Joint Research Commission. So these would recommend technologies, particularly for nutrient recovery, for the food, drink, and milk industries, as well as the slaughterhouses and animal byproducts and co-products uh, industries. So combined, these documents, I think it's in, in excess of over eight hundred pages. But if you're interested in reading the condensed version, uh, it's available on the Neptunus website at a, at a much more manageable um, 70, 70 pages, I think it was. So when we talk about circularity in seafood systems, one of the examples that we would have investigated and looked at was organic salmon. And again, nationally significant species, uh, but what we would have traced through it was identifying the levels of byproducts and the, the opportunities that were faced those. So mortalities in cold stock were sent primarily for rendering at the time, but there are opportunities there for anaerobic digestion as part of it. Sludge as well from our research kind of was an area that uh, has potential, but there may be limitations based on the, the availability of the material. And I'll touch back on that in, in a few minutes. Uh, from the processing side of things, again, again, frames, offal, trimmings, heads, all these aspects, uh, fish meal and fish oil is the primary market for those. But what we were able to observe from analyzing this, this value chain is that this is a very circular uh, system. The system has been constrained by very limited supply. And so value has had to be found in almost every aspect of, 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 the, of the available material. So frames, if they can't be found, if a market can't be found for them as you know, an organic pet feed in, in Germany, these are sent for fish meal and fish oil. Frames uh, and, uh, sorry, the coal stock and lost stock are sent for energy. And as well, it, they've increased the utilization of the flesh on the carcass, uh, smoke these and send them as a, a value added product for salad dressings as part of, um, a, primarily in the French market, I think it is. We also see that they've discovered markets here for heads in markets where they're seen as a delicacy. And one of the things that we'll be hoping to kind of investigate further is this concept of uh, circular aquaculture and particularly looking at organic salmon and trying to uh, properly document and assess uh, the level of loss and the level of retention of that, that food within it and how much of that nutrient uh, products are, are lost. When we get into uh, 
the sludge side of things. In order to comply with discharge licenses, almost all freshwater fish farms end up having a series of these. So these are drum filters and they are to collect the solids from the, from the fish farms. So a secondary step that a lot of them go through is pass through this uh, belt filter where a polymer is added to help thicken and increase the quality of the sludge. So we had the task of taking some of that back to a lab, dehydrating it, combusting it. Yeah, well, it shouldn't have combusted, but it, it had a quite a high, high percentage of volatile solids. And based on that, converting it across, we were able to show that if the farms were able to um, valorize the energy and get credit back for it, that particularly for one of the sites, it was enough to nearly offset about 18.5% of their, um, their annual CO2, particularly for 2018. For another site where the sludge process wasn't as particularly efficient, they would have managed to save 6.4% on their emissions. Uh, other circular opportunities for further investigating this, um, this concept is to look at the sludge digestate, um, because there, there is evidence out there that uh, digested sludge has a higher bioavailability of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. So again, kind of using hope within, I suppose, life cycle assessment, what we'd call avoided production, you can kind of credit this back to the, uh, to the original producer. Um, another aspect, another project that we was involved with was this project here, Shilakwa, which is um, just finishing now. And as part of that project, we again tried to look at circularity and trying to identify opportunities as, as part of this for, for the, particularly the shell waste. So what we were able to, to identify was that most of the mortalities are currently used for construction material on on-site roads. So particularly in the oyster sector, um, whereas for the mussel sector, sometimes that product was uh, lost or returned to sea. Uh, for this processing side here, it's actually, it's poorly worded. Uh, processing for mussels at sea was sometimes returned back, whereas other sites had, uh, you know, set up a proper waste disposal, um, uh, waste disposal for, for mortality or for, for ungraded stock or damaged stock. But overall, there is an appetite within the industry to find some opportunity to, to increase the uptake of these byproducts and to find value. So some of it, some, some of the things that were looked at were looking at it as, as Maria mentioned earlier on, looking at it as, as a feed component, primarily for the, the poultry industry was what we, we were looking at. Looking at it as a constituent in, in plastic production is, is one of the ones that we had hoped to investigate, but um, we didn't get a, a full opportunity to. And then there's also the building sector as well. <clears throat> Other, other emerging areas for shellfish byproducts include uh, their use for treatment in exhaust gases, uh, heavy metals as part of water treatment, and then higher value opportunities such as um, biofillers and uh, as well as composites uh, for bio-based materials. And particularly for the medical device sec sector, there seem to be opportunities there, but the, they, they will need to be uh, investigated further, I think. So the closing slides I'm going to talk about is just this concept, life cycle assessment. And life cycle assessment or LCA, is, it's kind of abbreviated to, was used throughout all the, the previous projects that I, I mentioned. So it's an ISO standardized methodology and it's used to assess uh, the environmental impacts of a product. What you may be familiar with as part of LCA are footprints such as water, carbon, energy footprints. And one of the easiest ways to kind of break down and explain LCA is to look at it as an input. It's the inputs and the outputs multiplied by the, their impacts. And one of the one of the ways that we kind of like to describe it is, is it's environmental accounting. So at the end of it all, we have to ensure that the, there's a mass balance or a balance has been struck between the inputs and the outputs and the impacts. What it also allows us to do is to look at, to analyze the value chain and identify environmental hotspots as part of that. Um, but LCA and circular economy, they, they will they end up going kind of hand in hand as well. While LCA has limitations, it is a very useful tool for, to support the circular uh, to transition to a circular economy. And even back in uh, 2001, I think it was the, <clears throat> the secretary for the UN uh, spoke about the transition to a life cycle economy. So these two concepts do pair well, and I need to investigate a little bit further and see is did the circular economy uh, or did the life cycle economy become the circular economy? Um, I, I think it did, but I need to verify it. Uh, other aspects with LCA, particularly as part of circular economy, 
uh, show that it can highlight areas of improvement, can also help us to critically evaluate decisions, can also show us how to compare scenarios and solutions, particularly to see you know, types of packaging, uh, are, there, are there environmental gains to be had through that? And it can also show us, allow us to model changes, particularly in energy mixes, uh, recycling rates and, uh, and other things like that. Um, so as part of the, the work in BIM, we'll be hoping to further kind of roll out LCA and circular economy as part of some of BIM's work. But to date, BIM has, has been primary, has carried out a lot of work in looking at byproducts and the reduction of food waste. One of the big projects that they were involved in up until 2020, I think it was, was to look at uh, was this project called Food Heroes, which was funded by Interreg Northwest Europe. This project uh, reduced the seafood, wa seafood waste by about 545 tons and identified opportunities which, if capitalized upon, could reduce between 14,000 and 17,000 tons of uh, seafood waste per annum. It looked at increasing the utilization of uh, fish co-products and byproducts such as the heads and frames, uh, dehydrating them, trying to, to increase the, the, the shelf life of it for, for markets that were a little bit away. It also looked at trying to find value added opportunities for skins, particularly as uh, salmon skin crisps, which, uh, which would be interesting to try. It also tried to pull up um, reform uh, trimmings that would historically have been discarded or would not have had a, a huge amount of value. Uh, overall, quite quite a successful and interesting project. Uh, another project that BIM was active in was to look at ident uh, identify potential uses for unwanted catches. And again, it kind of brought it back to that food feed, energy, fertilizer approach that I mentioned earlier on. And they came up with a, sim a simpler matrix than what we, we had as part of Neptunus, where it was simply a volume to value ratio uh, with a, a little four-step matrix here. And again, depending on the volume of your material uh, to, to the value, of course, you could target higher value added products like uh, hydrolysis and or uh, chitin. So BAM has done quite a, quite a lot of work on byproducts. And one of the things I'll be hoping to do in the next while is to uh, bring all that stuff together and, and further see, can we find more circular applications for it? Uh, in the future, uh, that work will be carried out primarily using the the EMFAF, which we're hoping to be, will be rolled out in uh, 2023. So there's qu quite quite a number of opportunities there for for seafood um, and byproduct utilization. So uh, thanks very much for your time, and I'm not sure if I gone too far over time, Cleaner. <laughs> Not at all. Um, fantastic timekeeping today. <laughs> Thank you, Ronan. That's really, really interesting. And um, especially the overview of BIM when you're only five months in the door. So it's great to, to get that insight. Um, we don't have any questions in the Q&A just yet, but I have a few here for you. Um, I'll try not uh, to, to drop the boat too much. Um, but you mentioned, I suppose, that Ireland has a limited supply or the scale of the waste streams available. Is there any business models or existing framework in other countries that could be applied in Ireland, in Ireland? Or do you see a way that we can overcome the, the fractioned or dispersed supply of the waste raw material? Um, it's, it's, it's a little bit early yet for me to kind of give you a full answer on that. But one of the things that uh, I am hoping to kind of take up and, and do is to kind of look at a rough inventory of material that's available for for the markets and what could be valorized. So mm -hmm. looking at, we, we do, as Maria kind of indicated earlier on, we it's very easy to just multiply out the discards and the, you know, the, the carcass yields and all this kind of stuff. So it's just to sit down and frame that up. But um, is there, there, are, there are models that are quite interesting occurring in, I think, uh, Alaska and Iceland, where there's quite a high, high degree of circularity and a quite a high degree of utilization of almost all these um all, all the all the animals mm -hmm. so okay great um a flagship project that BIM worked on in the project sector was blue whiting um but turning to aquaculture um where are the opportunities or where are the key or what are the key species um that you think the industry need to kind of zone in on and Maria is welcome to pop into this one as well yeah um 
Uh, well, I, sp I suppose from a fin fish pers perspective, uh, salmon primarily would be the the the, the key one. There there is a quite a high degree of circularity anyway <clears throat> within yeah. it, but um, the it, there will need to be further kind of digging in to see other opportunities or higher value opportunities for that. Uh, in terms of shellfish, uh, I think Maria might be a better better place to answer those kind of questions uh, with the mussels project. God, I don't know, Ronan. <laughs> I think, uh, like, in Ireland, I guess, like, the mussel industry would be, I'm maybe biased, but I think that, you know, there are opportunities there and there's already companies doing things with byproduct there. Um, and it's a sector that needs to have value added to it, I think, because last time I was speaking to mussel growers, the the market value per tonne was quite low. I know it increased a bit, but, you know, it, it could do with... Um, you know, other streams of revenue, I guess, for producers. So, uh, and like we have such a high quality product here in Ireland as well, from what I can see. And, and even the co-products are very high quality that uh, a focus on that might be one. You know, in the pelagic sector, I know bar funding has really impacted on on what people can catch, you know, um, like we're looking at mesopelagics in the meso project, you know, and at the moment there's no quotas assigned to those. Uh, so maybe that's an opportunity for pelagic processors going forward. Okay, great. But on the aquaculture side, um, I, I guess I'd agree with Ronan, salmon, trout <laughs> as well, possibly. Um, there's lots of stuff that can be done there too. Okay, great stuff. We don't seem to have any questions coming in um, there, but I'd like to take the opportunity to thank everyone, um, our fantastic panellists today and um, for the really insightful information um, that they gave us. So this was the second um, event in a four part series. The next one is um, online on the 1st of December. Um, and there we're talking, I suppose, about the funding opportunities for, for the value added and the waste valorization streams. Um, as well as that, we'll have an in-person event on the 8th of December in Sagask. So um, we'll be keen to, to see some of our attendees there. Um, again, a huge thank you to Maria and Wern in Sagas for organizing this great event. So if you have any questions, um, please get in touch with either myself um, or, or Mwirin, and we'll be sharing some more information in regards to uh, the subsequent events and um, recordings of this one. Okay, Gurmila Mahagi. <laughs>